Before we get into this week's episode, a word of warning. If you haven't yet watched Magpie Murders, please stop listening to this podcast right now and watch that series first, as we're about to discuss the ending of Magpie Murders and reveal the killer. Consider this a blaring spoiler alert before we get into Moonflower Murders. Sufficiently warned? Ready? Okay, grab your copy of Atticus Pun Takes the Case, and let's head off to Branlow Hall. I'm Jace Lacob, and you're listening to Masterpiece Studio. Susan Ryland doesn't gladly suffer fools or unruly authors, but by the end of Magpie Murders, our beloved editor and amateur sleuth had been put through an emotional ringer. Not only had her old boss, Charles, accidentally killed their best-selling author, Alan Conway, but in the process of trying to cover it up, tried to murder Susan, who had unmasked her old friend as Alan's killer. At the start of Moonflower Murders, however... Susan is in a very different place, quite literally. On the surface, Crete might seem like the perfect location to relax and recuperate. Beautiful beaches, slow pace of life, and excellent food. But the reality is that there's nothing relaxing about owning a hotel that's crumbling before her eyes. Andreas, we have no electricity, we have plenty of water, but it's all over the kitchen. What are we going to do? We'll manage. We have 14 guests at the hotel. How are we going to cook lunch? We'll make salad. Unlike her partner, Andreas, Susan isn't cut out for this type of life. When she's not putting out kitchen fires and mopping leaks, Susan browses publishing jobs online. And although it's not exactly what she's looking for, a new opportunity soon shows up at the hotel check-in desk. I'll try to be as succinct as possible, Susan. But we honestly believe you're the only person that can help us. We have nowhere else to go. All right. Tell me. A missing persons case tied to a murder that happened eight years ago drags Susan right back into the world of sleuthing, and strangely enough, back to the world of books. It appears this case might have something to do with the late best-selling author Alan Conway, and his novel Atticus Pund Takes the Case. We're soon cast back into the world of 1950s Devonshire, a fictional world that's eerily similar to Branlow Hall, the hotel in which the murder took place eight years earlier. Chorley was a picturesque village in the county of Devonshire, known for its lush countryside and cream teas. In the summer of 1954, its most famous resident was, without doubt, Melissa James, the British actress who had climbed to the very peak of the Hollywood Heights until an accident on the set of a Hitchcock film had brought a sudden end to her career. Our guest today is Anthony Horowitz, the creator of Masterpiece's 2022 production Magpie Murders, and now Moonflower Murders. With his Atticus Pun stories, Anthony pushes the bounds of murder mysteries by taking audiences and readers to worlds within worlds, stories within stories, and murders within murders. In this conversation, we peel back the layers of Anthony's latest adaptation, the meta-mystery series Moonflower Murders. This week, we are joined by Moonflower Murders creator, writer, and executive producer, Anthony Horowitz. Welcome. Thank you very much, Jason. Nice to be talking to you. So we previously spoke about the genesis of Magpie Murders, born out of the notion of crafting a new style of whodunit while also capturing what it's like to be a mystery writer. As much as I loved reading Magpie Murders, I was skeptical a sequel would work. After all, Atticus Pund and Alan Conway were both dead. But I was delighted when you pulled it off with Moonflower, which to me is an even more accomplished, richer, twistier mystery. Were you looking to outdo yourself to top Magpie Murders, as it were? I'm delighted by what you said. So thank you very much indeed, because one of my greatest fears in life is you have a success. So you immediately uh, follow it up with a sequel and the sequel somehow lets people down and isn't as good. And it's a problem because for the writer, for the adapter, you have to give people what they like. So that says do the same again, but you don't do the same again because that would be boring. So you would do it differently. So it is a question of, you know, how do you do things the same but different? For example, in the in the first book, there is one chapter missing. In the book inside the story, you know, Alan Conway has written a book and one chapter is missing and that chapter contains the solution to the mystery. So having done that, I couldn't do the same thing again. So in, 
In Moonflower Murders, Susan has now got a complete book, but doesn't understand quite what is hidden inside it, but has led to the disappearance of a young woman. And that in itself adds a sort of a beating heart to the show because there is a tension. I'm talking about the character Cecily Traherne, who has just vanished after having read one of the Atticus Pun novels and has read something in the book that relates to her disappearance. And that is very real and very serious and adds a completely different sort of atmosphere to the show. So that does exactly what I hoped it would do, which is to set it apart from Magpie Murders, even whilst doing some of the same things again. Alan Conway, the writer at the center of Magpie Murders, is himself murdered within the first book. Atticus Pund, his hated creation, has a terminal illness. How did you, after writing Magpie, come up with how Susan Ryling would be pulled back into his orbit and solve another crime involving one of Alan's other novels? Well, the first thing I was determined upon was that that we would not lose Conleth Hill, who plays Alan Conway, because he's so brilliant and so witty and so gets the tone of the show so exactly right and is so valuable to us. But then I realized that if the story concerned an earlier book, an earlier Atticus Pun novel, there are nine in total. Magpie Murders was the ninth in a series. But if we went back to the third, fourth, or fifth, then Alan Conway and Atticus Punt would both be alive and in good health, and one could almost start again. And I was surprised how, how simply that worked, how, how once I'd had that thought, just go back, you know, you lost all the baggage. I think audiences would not particularly have appreciated, you know, one of your main characters dead and one terminally ill. It's all a bit of a downer, isn't it? I wanted it to have that joy that the first season it had, and going back was the answer. So the first episode of Moonflower opens at a wedding at Branlow Hall before shifting to Sun Dappled Crete, where we meet Susan Ryland hiking in the heat. She's left behind the editorial world to become a hotelier in Crete. Gone is the leather jacket, the MG, her signifiers, and in their place is drudgery and a sense of hopelessness. Is Susan looking for an escape route when we pick up with her in episode one? Uh, well, drudgery in a sense of hopelessness is perhaps overdoing the sort of the dark side of it. She is in Crete, and I think the one of the great heroes of the second season, and something that definitely we didn't have in the first season, is Crete itself. The first time we see Susan in episode one, when she is, you know, walking across the Cretan countryside, and there are goats with their bells tinkling, and cheery farmers who, who greet her in Greek, and and all that, you get a sense of somebody who is. Yes, she has her problems, and certainly the hotel is a bit of a disaster, but she is sort of dealing with it, and she is she is very much the Susan that we know, but there is something missing from her life, and what is missing from her life, apart from murder and mystery, is being an editor and books. And I think that that, that setup, it just sort of fitted exactly for her. You know, the, the, that sort of hotel, I know it. I mean, I have stayed in that hotel. It exists, and, and the job we had was to make it not too funny, not too silly, not to go too 40 towers on it, but to try and treat it realistically, to give her the reason to want to leave and to come back to England, which of course is where the, where the murder happens. So it's still a happy Calimera. It's not a... An, a... I, think, I think she is she's dissatisfied. She's frustrated. Her relationship with Andreas is not going too well, mainly because of the rigors of running a hotel and all the problems that come with it. And she is under stress. And then what happens is that a couple walk into the hotel with this story about their missing daughter. There is a sense of urgency. She also needs money, and they offer her a great deal of money to help them. And she really has no choice. By the end of episode one, it is quite clear that, that whatever her feelings are, she must go back to Britain, to, to you, the UK, because so much depends on it. So as you say, Susan's hired by the Trehearns to find their missing daughter, Cecily. Her disappearance is connected to an Alan Conway novel. The Traherns are themselves successful owners of country hotel Branlow Hall, which is the perfect backdrop for a mystery a la Agatha Christie's at Bertram's Hotel. How did you arrive at setting the action at a hotel this time? Well, I think that, that having done a village in the first season, I wanted something that was completely different to that, so, but, but still had that sense of assembly of strangers or people who half know each other. And I think hotels just make a great setting for a murder mystery, or indeed for lots of films. I mean, one, one of the great inspirations for me was Stephen King and The Shining, you know, where he understood perfectly well that hotels are witnesses to all sorts of evil deeds, that people come to hotels and, and they fight, they argue, they divorce, they, they commit adultery, or they commit murder. 
And so the idea of a hotel being a place that has a memory and where bad things have happened in the past just came very easily to my mind as being an interesting setting, added to which I liked the contrast between Susan and the Hotel Trefoli, which is a disaster, and Branlow Wall with the Moonflower Wing in Suffolk being the exact opposite of her experience. And I think that also, you know, she's a fish out of water in Crete, but she's also a fish out of water when she arrives back in the UK. I mean, that's one of the things I love about this is that she does have to confront a more successful version of herself to work this case. She's seeing herself and her business through a dark mirror. There's a another doubling, in a sense, in which her counterpart, Pauline Treherne, is is more successful than she. Well, that's absolutely right. But the main character who I think offends her most is the sister. Cecily Treherne has gone missing. She has a sister called Lisa. And Lisa, who has a scar, just like one of the main characters in Alan Conway's novel, uh, is extremely uh, exercised by Susan's arrival and, and is angry that she has been paid a lot of money to come there and, and disdains everybody. You know, the success of the hotel, she says, is down to her. And one of the things I really enjoy about this season, in fact, is the conflict between Susan and Lisa. In fact, Susan has a pretty rough time throughout this show. Uh, you know, with people turning against her. But it's there very much so in that first meal that she has with Lisa and the, and the father, uh, where she realizes she really is not welcome, at least not by some of the people in that hotel. You've spoken about your love for Crete. What does Crete represent for Susan Ryland? Is it an illusion, a dream, a utopia? Well, at the end of Magpie Murders, she was in a very bad place. She had been very nearly killed. She'd been uh, beaten on the head and left to, to burn in an office. And... Uh, and as a result of that, her business had gone under. Her author, her best-selling author, was dead. The deal she had hoped for, which would make her into a managing director, a senior editor, and a publisher in, in a successful company, had regressively gone away. And, and so Cree was almost a sort of a last resort, actually. I mean, I think that when she left for Cree to the end of season one, there was a big part of her that knew that it probably wasn't going to work out. But right then, there was no other option. So I suppose it was a sort of a chimera is what it was. It was an illusion. But I think it was one in which she willingly partook. In this Alan Conway novel within the novel or within the show, Atticus Punt takes the case. He has a different assistant. He has a different relationship with his own mortality. As you said, this is set earlier in time. Was it an opportunity then to present Atticus at an earlier stage of his life, moving Pund backwards in a way in time, while Susan moves forward in her own? I don't think the Pund in this story is radically different to the one in Magpie Murders, because I think this is a fairly concentrated part of his life, and it only took place, probably the two stories are only about three or four years apart, actually, in time. I think the biggest difference is his assistant. He has um, Fraser, James Fraser in Magpie Murders, but he hasn't arrived yet. We know from the, if we've read the books carefully, that he only turned up in about books five once Alan Conway met his partner and put him into the books. That was when James Fraser appeared. But this time, the assistant is a lady called Madeline Kane, who is, is a world apart from the second assistant. She is she's very sweet and she's very ambitious for Punch. She's clearly devoted to him. She has an edge of comedy to her herself as well. Uh, Peppa Bennett Warren brings a sort of a, a wonderful warmth and wit to the part, which I think does redefine Punt as well. Let's not forget that he only takes the case in Moonflower Murders with her persuasion. He's just out there to, to finish writing his the book he's always writing, Landscape of Criminal Investigation. But she says, no, no, this is going to be good for your career. It's good for your profile. I think you should take it. So I like that new relationship, and I think it does redefine it. Moonflower and Magpie are books and television series that explore the act of creation, stealing fire from the gods in some way. How do you view the act of creation? Is, is writing a compulsion for you? Writing is my love, it's my passion, it's my life. I, I write, I suppose, like a fish swims or, or like a bird flies. I, I, I was born to write and, and I was actually born for pretty much nothing else. Um, I love every aspect of it from the sort of the thinking up of the ideas to the to the sort of beginning to, to sort of construct the, the, you know, the structure of the book and then the actual writing of it. And I love everything that follows, the publication, the, you know, the, and then the adaptation and the, and the television and the, to all of it. I mean, there's, I, I can't really describe it to you. My writing, I, I use fountain pens rather than a computer because I love ink. I love nibs. I love, I love the idea that I am part of a tradition, not as great as any of the great writers I admire, but nonetheless, still in the tradition of Dickens or Orwell or, or, or Jane Austen, all of them used ink. And so I like having dirty fingers. And, and 
I'm at the moment writing a third uh, Adidas Pun novel, and um, just being back in that world again fills me with a sort of a pleasure that is, is hard to describe. I often talk about it as being immersion. When I write a book, everything else in my life is forgotten. I'm inside the book trying to describe what I'm seeing, what is happening around me, what people are saying, and, and hopefully creating a story that will entertain and, and beguile audiences. And, and, and that, I guess, is what I was born for. So hovering over the action, despite being dead himself, is magpie mystery novelist Alan Conway, who stole bits of people's lives. Like Alan, you use a fountain pen. You also put people you know into your work. You've killed off irksome teachers. Uh, in the novel Susan's Hotel in Crete, the Polydorus is an actual hotel. And you admit to this trend in the word is murder, you write. This is something I often do. When I killed him off at the end of episode four, it made me smile. Is Alan Conway a darker version of yourself, one who takes that borrowing to an extreme? No, there's a huge difference to Alan Conway and myself, and that is that he doesn't really enjoy what he wrote. I mean, the, 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 he was inspired largely by Conan Doyle, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, who created the greatest detective in fiction, Sherlock Holmes, but hated him and couldn't wait to get rid of him and very quickly threw him off the right and back walls to do exactly that. And Alan Conway is also malevolent. You know, I try. I've written uh, 60 novels now, and I've tried. Yes, I've killed off my teachers, but I doubt if they ever read any of the books. I think they were probably dead long before the books were published. And I wouldn't have read it anyway if it had my name on the cover. But, um, but, but I have never been willfully malevolent or unpleasant, I hope, to anybody. I try to bring joy to the, the world. I think that is the great thing about murder mystery stories, that despite the fact that they are about murder and often have a quite a dark edge to them, they just bring unalloyed pleasure. You read a murder mystery to get to the truth, and truth in this world at the moment is in very short supply, I often think. So I would have said that uh, I'm nothing like Alan Conway, but you are right. There are similarities, and it is true that I do use my life and, and where I've already mentioned that I, I spend a lot of time in Crete. And you're right, the Polydorus, which is uh, a hotel, is, is 10 minutes away from where I live. I go there almost every day. Uh, it's, it's in the TV show. It's renamed the Trifoli, but only because, and that's, again, the point I'm trying to make in the TV series, the hotel is... Is, is is really sort of awful, you know, it's falling to bits and nothing works and it's terrible. And I couldn't, you know, do that to a real hotel run by people I know and like. The only time I ever was called Alan Conway was by my wife, Jill, when I bought uh, a house in London. I, I moved house a couple of years ago. We, we bought a house that was a little bit too big for us. And she looked at me and she said, you know, this might be an Alan Conway house. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. Before this next question, a brief word from our sponsors. Ocean voyages, expeditions, river journeys. Viking is dedicated to bringing travelers closer to the destination offering a small ship experience and a shore excursion in every port. Learn more at viking.com. With Alan's death and the closure of Clover Books, Susan has put Pund out of her mind, but in the hot sun of Crete, he appears a ghost in her peripheral vision. Out of necessity, their dynamic on television is wholly different than in the novels. Has it surprised you how well the rapport between Susan and Pund, between Leslie and Tim, works? Well, we lucked out with both those actors, for sure. Leslie Manville is a huge star, and Tim O'Mullen, you know, is a rising star who worked with us on Foil's War for two seasons, and I love working with him then. And so having the two of them together on the screen is a joy. But of course, it is different, because what happened, again, this is down to the producer, to my wife, Jill Green, who pointed out to me that we had to somehow run the two worlds together. In Magpie Murders, the character of Susan Rallon doesn't really turn up for about 250 pages. You cannot have a TV series in which your main star, Leslie Mamble, as it turned out to be, doesn't appear until, shall we say, episode three or four. That's in, you know, she won't take the part anyway, and, and people won't watch. So having realized that Leslie and Tim would have to be pretty much having their adventures side by side, it wasn't a huge leap of the imagination to suddenly realize that they might talk to each other. They, they might have some kind of interaction or a, a relationship. But I think what is fun about it is that it's hard to say quite what Atticus Pud is when he's in the 21st century modern world. 
Does he exist? Is he a fictitious character out of a book who has somehow crushed the dimensions? Is he just in her imagination? Is he her conscience? You know, later on in the show, there is a scene which I particularly love when he and our, so I should say Susan and, and Punt are, are, are driving together and stop in a field and they have a slight argument about the case and she takes out a cigarette and lights it. Well, may, may I give you one other piece of advice? Of course. You should really stop smoking. You're not real, are you? You're just my guilty conscience. Always a pleasure to see you, Susan. Is it him saying it because he's worried about her health, or is it her conscience warning her, as she knows fully well, that cigarettes are bound for you? I mean, in Susan, we have an, an editor who is thrust into the role of a detective, and in Atticus, we have a detective who is a writer. I mean, to me, it's only natural that they would have this sort of simpatico spirits, that they would complement each other as they do. You know, Jace, that's a great observation, and it's never occurred to me until now. You're absolutely correct, of course. An editor turned detective, a detective who writes. And it would be interesting to see what, uh, what our Susan would make of the landscape of criminal investigation. A, a passage of which, incidentally, I wrote only a, a few weeks ago for the new book. Uh, it's the first time I actually wrote a little extract from that book. It's, uh, you know, the, the big thing here is, is that I am not interested in writing, as it were, straightforward, classic murder mysteries. I enjoy them. I admire them. You know, I, Agatha Christie, Dorothy L. Sayers, Ellery Queen. I love all these sort of golden age authors. But I'm just trying to do something a little different. And I like the fact that there isn't really a detective in this show. Yes, there's Punt, but he doesn't exist. And yes, there's Susan, but she isn't a detective. Um, so, so I, you know, I, I like also exploring the nature of writing. I've always said that a murder mystery can't just be about murder, and it can't just be a mystery. You know, if you're writing three, four, five, or even 600 pages, you've got to give the reader a little bit more than the, the butler did it. And I love the fact that I can explore literature, I can explore the nature of crime, the nature of crime fiction, of why it is that a murder committed um, in real life in the streets of Los Angeles or New York or London or wherever is disgusting and horrific and we all get upset about it, but a murder committed in a story makes us smile. Why is that? These are the sorts of questions I can ask and explore. And with each book I write, I get to sort of, you know, look at other aspects of exactly that. And it fascinates me as much, if not more, than who did it. I mean, Pun says to Susan at one point in this, Murder is the worst of all crimes. Not only because of the lives it destroys, but they're also the reverberations. Huh? It's like a stone dropped into the sea. The ripples, they... I'm all the way to the shore. Do you think that is then why we love that vicarious thrill, the, the tangled net that they cast in their wake, murder mysteries, entangling not just the victim, but everyone around them? Uh, is that part of the, the appeal? I think that is definitely part of the appeal, although Punt does put it in sort of language I, I wouldn't use myself. I mean, all that stuff about water rippling and reaching every fibre of society and life and all the rest of it is perhaps a little bit fanciful for my taste, but that's Punt for you. <laughs> What intrigues me about the reappearance of Pund in Susan's life is that it, it actually precedes the Treherans' offer and not the reverse. I could see that her return to sleuthing might resurrect him in her mind, but it's the other way around. Why do you think she sees Pund at that moment, and, and what does his phantom appearance represent to Susan? It's a fantastic question, Jason. I have to say, you know the books, I think, better than I do. But uh, I put that in because it's a sort of, I think... There's no answer to it, and there's deliberately no answer, but I will give you one possible interpretation, which is that actually she is wistfully thinking she would like to investigate a second murder, and Punt comes to tell her it's going to happen. It's a sort of a foreshadowing, if you like, a premonition. It's a, uh, and that is why he, he appears there shimmering in the sunlight uh, in, a, in, a, in a shot. It's a beautiful little church. I was actually there when they were filming it that day, and it is way up in the hills. It is so perfectly creaking and so beautiful and the, the weather was gorgeous and and just seeing it happen just seeing tim mcmullen walking onto the set in that in that very non-cretan outfit just made me smile so much and it had almost the same effect on me it said yes we're doing it he's back moonflower and magpie are, are mysteries within mysteries they're metafictional texts that demand to be read and reread to find the breadcrumbs you've placed throughout but they also follow susan ryland as she moves in a world that is shifting around her how do you balance the cerebral with the emotional plot with story 
Um, well, plot and story, I think, are very closely allied. I mean, you know, the, the plot is, is, if you like, the, the scaffolding, which I spend an enormous amount of time putting up in order to carry the story and to make sure that everything makes sense. Um, and uh, actually, what matters even more than, than, than either of those two things, I think, is character, which is what you're talking about. You know, when, I, when I'm talking to, to murder mystery writers I'm always, or, or to new ones, I'm always saying that murder mystery is not really about murder. It's about character. Because if two people meet and one of them desires to kill the other and you, you start exploring the motives, they're not going to be mild. They're not going to be, you know, you don't murder somebody because you're a little bit trust with them or because they make you a, a quite, a, you know, in the English sense, a, a little bit angry. Uh, you murder them because <laughs> they, they, they create huge emotions in you, which leads you to do this unspeakable act. It's, you know, it's great, you know, biblical crime, one of the Ten Commandments. So it's right at the very core of the Christian religion, thou shalt not kill. So the emotions are what matters and the people are what matters. And for me, Everything always begins with that little tiny equation. A plus B equals C. A is one person. B is another person. C is the reason why A murders B. It's all about character. It's all about emotion. And plot and structure are, of course, essential too. But without that core, without, the, without that sort of heart to the thing, I don't see any point in writing it. Episode two of Moonflower, which airs next week, features a, a discussion between Pund and assistant Madeline about technology I do not like machines. You could say it was the machines that won us the war. The Spitfire, radar. But Nazism itself was a machine, so it always seemed to me. You mean with no humanity? Exactly. The more mechanical the age, inevitably it becomes less humane. This is Punda, I feel, at his most insightful. Is he acting as a mouthpiece for the author here, and is it easier to couch such insight within the context of a mystery in 1955, Devonshire. Well, it's certainly a much better observation than the stone uh, with its ripples spreading to all humanity, which we mentioned earlier. I think there is a lot of uh, sense in what he says. And I think, yes, there is in those words something I do believe in, particularly at the moment with social media and the way AI and the cell phone and certain platforms are taking over our life. But you have to be careful not to be a Luddite, not to say, you know, especially when you get to a certain age, not to say, oh, the world is so much worse now than it was when I sat down and took out my candle and my fountain pen and, you know, and, and mummy was, you know, or my, you know, somebody was pouring me a bath in the bedroom with, a, with a, you know, with, a, with hot coals or whatever. You know, it, I'm not saying let's go back to Victorian age. I just think we need to be very, very aware of what some, what quite a lot of technology is doing to our humanity. And if you ever go into a restaurant uh, and you see a family of four or five, all of them are on their cell phones, their iPads, their, their you know, whatever piece of machinery it is they pulled out of their pocket, and none of them are talking to themselves, you begin to see that we are fragmenting as a society, that, that our emotional links to each other are, are being weakened and tested, and we are becoming ever more isolated in worlds that are sort of, that can actually do us great harm. So I think Punt's words there do have a, a, well, it's obvious, it must be obvious for my answer to you, that what Punt says in that particular moment is true. And actually, of course, you've got to remember that he is a victim of the Second World War. And, and I think that it is perfectly reasonable and understandable why he should say that thing. But at the same time, he's saying something which I do, I think, uh, largely believe. Anthony Horowitz, thank you very much. Thank you. Next time, Pund, his efficient assistant, Madeline, and Detective Chubb stay hot on the case, even when the investigation just leads to more questions. I have to say, this is very good of you, Mr. Pund. Oh, the pleasure is all mine. Hmm. It's one of the benefits of being a private investigator, that it is the client who pays. <laughs> I'll send the bill to Mr. Schultz. And uh, who is that? He was Melissa James's agent. Her uh, American agent, huh? <laughs> it's he who employed me. Well, I'm glad you're here. <laughs> this case is a right puzzler and no mistake. <laughs> Nothing makes any sense. In three weeks, we'll be joined by Madeline Kane herself, actor Pippa Bennett Warner. But until then, be sure to tune in to Moonflower Murders on Sunday evenings at 9 p.m. Eastern on Masterpiece on PBS. Masterpiece Studio is hosted by me, Jay Slaycob, produced by Jack Pombriant, and edited by Robin Bissett. Alicia Ba Etup is our sound designer. The executive producer for Masterpiece is Suzanne Simpson. Hold up. 